Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jason Amsbaugh, and I'll be the moderator um, for this Southern Research webinar. In this webinar, Dr. Rebecca Buhacker from Southern Research will present her research on oncology drug development and the crucial role that the tumor immune microenvironment plays in the success of therapeutic intervention. Dr. Buhacker is the Director of Oncology for Southern Research's uh, Oncology Department, where she designs, oversees, executes, and interprets all cancer-related in vivo studies to evaluate potential cancer treatments. A couple quick housekeeping notes. First off, if you have questions during the presentation, please submit them here in the Q&A uh, bucket. You can go ahead and ask questions at any time during the presentation, and then we'll uh, have a Q&A session after the presentation is complete. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded. So if you have, uh, uh, so if you're not able to see all of it today, if you have to leave early, if you'd like to share it with your friends, if you'd like to watch it again after the fact, um, we'll be sending an email out in the next couple of days when that video is ready for on-demand viewing. All right. The So with that, uh, before we get started, we do have just a quick poll. The first question, which industry do you primarily work in? Academic, pharma, CRO, government, or other? The next question. In which stage of drug discovery or development do you work in? Hit identification, target validation, medicinal chemistry, preclinical, clinical, or other? And if you work in multiples, uh, go ahead and select those as well. And then our last question before we get started today. Um, does your program need services or support in one or more of the following areas? High throughput screening, medicinal chemistry, uh, computer aided drug discovery, biochemistry, other or none. All right, without any further delay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Buhacker. Thanks for that introduction. Um... Today, we're going to be talking about some of the drug discovery programs and uh, scientific platforms where the Department of Oncology is housed and how we've, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, begun to focus those efforts on um, addressing the immune microenvironment. Uh, so here's a little bit of what we're going to go over today. We're going to do a, a, a bit of a review on the, some of the um, most recent literature uh, understanding the immune microenvironment. And uh, then we're going to talk about how uh, we employ this in our drug discovery ever efforts. Uh, I'm going to highlight three programs in the oncology department that, that tackle some of these areas. And then finally, we're going to talk about how this is going to uh, impact precision oncology, uh, a big initiative here at Southern Research. And uh, then we'll summarize and, and answer any of your questions. So first, uh, understanding the complexities of the tumor immune microenvironment, um, the addition of the eye here is, is relatively new. Um, for anybody that's not familiar with the uh, immune microenvironment and anything beyond uh, CD8 T cells, uh, I encourage you to review uh, this particular article. It's, uh, it's one of my references uh, that I go back to um, all the time. Uh, as you can see, there's more to uh, the tumor than just the tumor cells. Uh, we're familiar with KRAS and BRAF and how those are uh, um, really uh, um, drivers of oncogenesis, but uh, what we need to consider is how macrophages and dendritic cells and the plasticity of these, of these cells play into um, chemo resistance. And a lot of the barriers that we that we find as we go through um, trying to develop novel therapies. So there are three subtypes that are laid out in this manuscript. The first is this uh, immune excluded phenotype, and so this is really characterized by a, a failure of infiltration due to physical barriers. So stromal fibrosis. Uh, 
physically puts up a barrier. If you look at this in, a, in an H&E slide, you can actually see the uh, fibrotic nests that, that prevent any T cells from infiltrating into the tumor core, rendering a, a lot of therapies ineffective. Uh, VEGF and VEGF receptor also plays a huge role in this, mainly by uh, influencing the angiogenesis to the tumor. Um, functional barriers, things that we target anyway. There's metabolic variances, high, hypoxia. We have a program right now in uh, HIF2 alpha in, in clear cell renal cancer uh, that is highly dependent on this metabolic variance. Uh, lipid metabolism, which will come into play a little bit later in the talk. Um, soluble signals, TGF beta. We have a program in this as well, looking at, at uh, localized uh, failure to convert a latent TGF beta into active TGF beta. Uh, the, the tumor and stromal associated suppressive mechanisms, things that are secreted out that, that prevent a proper immune response. Uh, danger sensing, tolerogenic cell death. This is a big thing. Um, when cells die, they're supposed to present a eat me signal that brings in macrophages that initiates an immune response. Uh, the CD47 serp alpha uh, axis uh, actually uh, mitigates that entirely, rendering uh, tumor cells blind to the immune clearance mechanisms. Beta catenin, MAP PI3 kinase, things that we already target um, that are components, but not the not the singular component, which is why they don't always work all the time. And we'll, we'll talk about a couple of those pathways as well a little bit later. And then dynamic barriers, uh, just straight up checkpoint inhibition, protein-protein uh, um, interactions, uh, things that uh, Keytruda tries to, to uh, tackle um, and how to maintain those, kind, those interactions of the T cells with uh, the cancer cells to elicit an anti-tumor response. The second type is this infiltrated and inflamed. Um, so this is this is shown by um, and characterized in, in, in biopsies as elevated levels of PDL1 on tumor cells. This automatically makes you eligible for any kind of uh, um, PD1 therapy. Um, because of the elevated levels of the of, of PDL1, you expect to see um, high PD1 on infiltrated T cells, a lot of infiltrated T cells that are producing granzyme B, which is the main killer of tumor cells, lots of interferon gamma, which is indicative of an inflammatory response. But you also get infiltrating myeloid cells that also express PDL1. And this is where we get into things like MDSCs that can be immunosuppressive. Um, what also is found in this is defects in DNA damage repair pathways, something that I worked on very early in my career here at Southern Research, uh, understanding what those DNA damage repair pathways uh, um, do and how they can be exploited to, uh, to then generate um, microsatellite instability, DNA fragmentation, neoantigens. Um, we have a couple of programs focusing specifically on this. To, to see if we can turn um, cold tumors, the immune excluded, into these, immune, uh, these, these infiltrated and inflamed tumors. The third type are these tumors that have uh, tertiary lymphoid structures. Um, we're not gonna focus too much on these. Uh, this, is a, this is a little bit more beyond the complexity of, of some of the programs that we have, but this is something that does exist and it's really neat. the the tumor uh, in, the tumor immune environment will may not be able to traffic out to a draining lymph node, so it'll make one. So these are ectopic but functional lymph nodes. They contain germinal centers and marginal zones, just like any other lymph node. You can see this here in uh, breast tissue. You get the follicle. You get the follicular uh, dendritic cells, CD4 cells, CD8 cells, a germinal center, and a draining vessel. It looks just like a lymph node would. It's just embedded in a solid tumor. These are typically associated with high tumor grades and they're prevalent in breast cancers and colorectal cancers. Uh, and, uh, and some of our in vivo models that are, um, that are immune competent, we actually do see some of these structures even at uh, gross necropsy. They're associated with high levels of inflammation and often with poor prognosis. So, 
knowing that the approach is to treat cancers like the infections that they are. And this is, if, if you were an infectious disease person, um, this is typically, you have a TH1 response that transitions into a TH2 response and then uh, winding down of your immune system. The, uh, the tumor progression is that, it's an infection at its base. And so what we're looking for is to keep the tumor immune microenvironment in an M1 phenotype. Um, and how we do that is something that, that may vary from patient to patient. Um, there are a lot of therapies that are coming through our shop that are looking at that. Um, some are small molecules, some are, some are proteins, some are uh, peptides, some are LMPs containing mRNAs. And what they're doing is they're trying to restore the balance by either uh, suppressing one of, these, one of these components that drives the M2 phenotype or uh, expressing something that's going to keep everything in this M1 phenotype. Um, what is becoming apparent is that these things cannot exist in, in monotherapies. They have to be coupled with other things, likely with uh, classical chemotherapies. Um, so because of that, we are looking to kind of change how we look at drug discovery in the oncology space. Um, I like this. This is how we do it here. This is a um, courtesy of uh, Dr. Sishwa Zhang who uh, runs our computer-aided uh, drug discovery. Um, he put this together and it's, um, I like it because if I were to have made this, I would have put biology at the dead center of a bicycle wheel. Um, but this shows how we really rely on each other in scientific platforms and our, in our different skill sets to have input into how um, programs move forward. So we have uh, HTS screening that can be run in parallel with, uh, with um, uh, in, silico, uh, uh, in silico screening. We do uh, in-house structural bio biology data. We do a, a little bit of protein um, expression purification. Um, we use bioinformatics for a lot of things, but mainly the thing is, is that we generate a lot of data a lot of compounds, a lot of, a lot of data points and a lot of different cell lines. And all of that feeds back into itself to advance how a, a compound moves, moves through. Um, we'll talk about some of the chemistry later, but the, the medicinal chemistry here is uh, uh, primarily a small molecule group. We're expanding. Um, we have excellent expertise in uh, nucleoside chemistry and also in turning peptides into small molecules. To kind of show our success here, this is this is these are our active drug discovery initiatives. Um, as you can see, we're going to talk about oncology today, but uh, we work in infectious disease, uh, in neuroscience, in um, dermatology, and in um, cystic fibrosis and kidney disease. Uh, most of these projects have come to us as targets that we have then developed into uh, into. Uh, uh, hit programs and then on into, as you can see, we'll talk about this, uh, DNFT1 is in a uh, clinical trial right now. These are, these are our programs. Um, currently, uh, we'll talk about uh, a couple of the efforts in breast cancer, uh, a couple of thionucleoside combination therapies, and then again, the DNA methyltransferase. So, we work on, I think we have seven active uh, programs that are internal and in collaboration with our academic partners. Um, we, we favor uh, uh, programs where we can uh, develop joint IP. Um, the best thing about being here at Southern Research is that we build a team around your program. It's a team of experts and um, we have we're very milestone driven in in developing those those uh, programs out. Um, our internal programs, looking through the lens of the immune microenvironment, uh, fit along this wheel. So uh, TGF beta again uh, is is a program that we won't talk about today that that looks at uh, uh, reducing the immunosuppressive signaling and um, impairment of the T cell infiltration by um, uh, by uh, 
avoiding the remodeling of the uh, extracellular matrix. matrix. Um, Glee, we will talk about today, um, has a huge signaling role in, 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 uh, in promoting uh, transcriptional uh, elements that are uh, promote chemo resistance in, in a couple of different uh, uh, very hard to treat cancers. Uh, thiarabine, uh, we'll talk about as well in, in, in the context of uh, uh, combination therapy. And then we'll talk about uh, our PD-1 small molecule inhibitors. Uh, if you have any questions about any of these other programs, we are happy to discuss them. Um, feel free to contact me through the website and we, and we, can, we can talk about those. So the first, we're going to talk about um, repurposing of nucleosides. Uh, so again, uh, Southern Research has seven FDA-approved drugs. Most of those are nucleosides. Uh, our director of chemistry, Omar Murkashavik, has uh, is the, um, the brain behind a lot of these uh, compounds. Um, we've worked together since I got here, um, and he predates me by another decade. Um, so thiarabine uh, was first synthesized and evaluated in 2000 at SR. I believe Omar did work on this. Um, it's, it's a deoxycytidine analog with activity in solid tumors. And the way that it works is it's a DNA RNA synthesis inhibitor. And so what ends up happening in prolonged um, inhibition of, that, of those mechanisms is you end up in mitotic catastrophe. And that leads to uh, immunogenic cell death. In tumor cells with DNA mis mismatch repair, um, this is highly advantageous. So uh, the question we wanted to ask is, could this be a primer? So we had uh, we had a series, we had some uh, um, murine cell lines uh, that do have a DNA uh, mismatch repair uh, deficiency, and we ran the experiment. So we took uh, thiarabine, we took one of uh, Omar's analogs and uh, ran them in a cytotoxicity test. Uh, uh, the cytotoxicity was, was pretty great. Um, we wanted to see if the mechanism, if the hypothesis was true that, that the mitotic catastrophe would release um, DNA into the, into the, uh, into the um, supernatant and could then be activated in cells. So we did a tunnel assay to look for DNA fragmentation. And then, looked for uh, CD4, CD8 um, activation and exhaustion in, in uh, just PBMCs isolated from mice. And we saw what we expected to see, which was that in a dose-dependent response, you could take that, uh, that uh, uh, mix from the supernatant and show activation in uh, immune cells. We think that it's through a TLR mechanism. Uh, we only looked at the T cells because at the time we're looking at um, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibition. Uh, this will have to go back and be investigated to see exactly, uh, exactly what's contributing to this. Um, likely it's, it's something in the innate immune system that's, that's being triggered. So we actually ran the experiment and took thiarabine and that uh, analog and ran them in combination and alone with Keytruda. And so using the same MC MC38 uh, syngenetic model, just to have a complete immune system, uh, we saw significant tumor reduction in combination. And when we ran the tumor regrowth, uh, um, discontinued treatment and washed out the drug, the uh, both protide and um, thiarabine itself uh, showed no regrowth in, um, in most of the mice. So what did we do? We re-implanted them. Um, and when we re-implanted them, what we found is that there was no tumor growth. And what we got was an effector memory response. So whatever thiarabine did in the, to the MC38 cells generated such a response um, in the tumor environment that when challenged again, that antigen was, was robust enough to mount a, a response so that the tumor never regrew. And this is what we want to see. Um, we want to be able to circumvent uh, any sort of uh, recurrence by uh, triggering an immune response that can recognize the cells even, even as they try to migrate to distal areas. Um, and you can see here 
when we looked in the in the uh, draining lymph nodes that um, with both the analog and uh, thiobine, we were able and this and these mice were never treated again. That response was durable and robust. So, um, piggybacking off of that, we looked to design because we are a small molecule group. Uh, a small molecule inhibitor to uh, PD-1, PD-L1. And this is published in uh, 2018 in Cancer Letters if you want a deep dive into it. But uh, we use uh, in silico modeling and um, sequence analysis and uh, molecular dynamics to model what um, an inhibitory peptide would look like. And looking at the interface of uh, PD-1 and PD-L1, there's a contiguous uh, beta strand in PD-L1 that is um, mainly conserved throughout uh, most mammalian species. Here's the sequence right here. And what we did was we did basically a truncation um, analysis looking at uh, charged residues and took this 12-mer and um, got it down to a very charged uh, uh, the DYKR sequence here, and from there we were able to um, we were able to turn it into a small molecule. So here's a, a, a the way that we evaluated this was using a microfluidics technique in, in which the uh, central chamber here in blue was a, a PDL1 expressing uh, uh, MDMB two thirty one cells, and down here these are uh, these are uh, jerkat cells. And so the way this chamber is set up is it's set up to mimic uh, vasculature and the extravasation of a T cell into a tumor microenvironment. So we know that the, that the MDMB231 cells are going to put out the, the chemokines to attract um, a, a naive T cell into the environment. The question is, would, it, would those cells be able to kill the uh, cancer cells once they got there? And part of that is because of whatever else is being secreted by those 231 cells that would be suppressive. So to overcome that, we, we put in uh, an anti-PD-1 antibody and looked at the trafficking and did the same thing for the dipeptide that was derived off that 12-mer and then a small molecule from there. And then finally our, our lead candidate here. And after, so this was 24 hours of continuous flow at a physiological flow rate. And um, this cutout here shows the overlay of the, that the more purple it is, the more the, uh, the, the co-localization of the T cell with the, with the, uh, uh, with the cancer cell is. Um, and then looking at an XM5 for cell death, uh, you can see that both the dipeptide and our lead compound were most effective in A, killing the cancer cells and B, maintaining the health and viability of the, uh, of the jerkat cells. This here is a close up of that video where you can see the cells trafficking in. And here in the end, you can see where the T cell has attached and will kill that cell. And so this was really promising to us because it showed that we had uh, an, an on mechanism effect from something that was derived from a peptide sequence that was, that, that was derived from understanding a protein-protein interaction. So uh, we did an NMR of this and showed that uh, 42475, our, our lead candidate here, does indeed bind. And Cishra did the modeling and the docking score and showed that this, this does interact exactly where we thought it would. And so from there, we went to in vivo proof of principle, where we ran this head to head with Keytruda and showed that there was a, obviously there's still some lead optimization to go on, but showed that there was an effect that was that was tantamount to the Keytruda um, uh, the Keytruda uh, efficacy, uh, but also what was really neat is when we looked at the immune profiling of the residual tumor, and this is what we're really excited about, if we look at uh, the, 
the uh, indicators of exhaustion, we get a nice robust uh, T, uh, CD8 T cell population here that can then be broken down into various exhaustion markers. And then if we look at the exhaustion markers in the untreated tumor, we see that we have a large number of um, tumor infiltrates that are present relative to the untreated tumor and that those are very much active. And so this is where this program is. We're looking to take something like the like thiarabine or the next generation of thiarabine, pair it with our small molecule inhibitor and have something that's both uh, orally bioavailable and um, able to induce this kind of durable response. So the next program we're gonna talk about is uh, microenvironment uh, modulation through Gli transcription inhib inhibition. Back to this picture up here, uh, there's a canonical function of Gli uh, and a non-canonical -canon function of Gli. And the non-canonical function is driven by both krsg 12 d and BRAF B600E, coincidentally. Um, this leads to the activation of a number of different uh, transcription transcriptional elements that promote uh, aberrant DNA damage repair, uh, promote invasion of metastasis, and promote, uh, promote proliferation. Our strategy here uh, was to target the convergence of these two pathways, and you'll see why in a second. So we showed a uh, clinical correlation between um, Glee uh, overexpression and NBS1, a member of uh, the MRN complex in the DNA damage repair pathway, uh, and poor prognosis with uh, patients with uh, V600E tumors, uh, colorectal cancer patients. Um, and the reason why is because the DNA damage induced by 5 fluorouracil in a full FOX treatment uh, is immediately repaired by overexpressed NBS1. And we know that. So we ran this series of experiments where we looked at uh, um, HC29 is a Gle, uh, GLE1 dependent uh, cell line, HCT8 is not. Um, there is com there's resistance to 5-4-Uracil in the HC29, um, which would be the primary treatment in this cancer. If we were to if we were to target the canonical pathway with vismotegib, which is a SMO inhibitor, um, there is no effect. It, it it's there's no effect. And then to look at uh, GANT sixty one, which is a uh, tool compound, you see a slight shift. Um, if we put these in combination, treat with GANT sixty one, and then come back and treat with five fluorouracil, then we restore that sensitivity in those cells. So, um, in an effort to not have to use GANT sixty one, which pharmacologically is very poor, we uh, set out to discover something better, and we did that with uh, SR three eight eight three two. It's marginally better, but uh, it does have improved pharmacological properties. It does all the same things that GANT61 does. Um, further, it induces uh, DNA damage, as you can see in these uh, uh, common assays. And there's a decrease in NBS1 that is uh, GLE specific and an increase in caspase 3. So we've now induced immunogenic cell death. We also are able to reduce tumor volume in a cell line that is resistant to 5-FU. Uh, and this bore out in uh, assessment of the tumor for um, NBS1 reduction in, um, due to GLE inhibition. So this was a, a finding out that NBS1 was a target of GLE transcription was um, happenstance. The GLE has a very strong um, canonical uh, binding, uh, binding sequence uh, shown here in red. And we wanted to understand what else this would do. So moving up in the, in the signaling pathway, we looked at KRAS as a driver of BRAF and found out that uh, G12D specifically, which is the mutation in ASPC1 and pancreatic cell lines, uh, is 
the driver of Lee transcription. And the consequence of, of that is increased production of TGF, uh, TGF beta, uh, specifically TGF beta one, which makes sense in context. Now, if we go back and look at the, at the, um, uh, at the immune uh, exclusive environment, that TGF beta would cause for uh, extracellular uh, matrix remodeling and therefore present a barrier to entry for any immune cell that would come in. Uh, here's proof that uh, G12D is the driver as we see the same kind of banding pattern in a lot of these markers that you would look at in terms of immunosuppressive signaling. So where are we with this program? Where we are with this is really trying to drill down in this into this TGF beta mechanism and to understand where we can partner other compounds with the glee inhibitor while improving the potency of the glee inhibitor. Uh, we have a manuscript submitted to cancer research examining the role of G12D uh, in fatty acid metabolism, which again is another one of those signaling mechanisms that, that drives that immune exclusive environment. Um, this is one of the main figures from that paper showing um, efficacy of, uh, again, GANT61 in reducing the tumor burden in, um, in a high-fat diet uh, uh, in pancreatic cancer. So uh, there's a lot more to understand at the basic biology level of, of this program, but uh, understanding how um, modulating the uh, a transcription factor like this can have a greater effect on a number of different things that contribute to uh, immune exclusion is uh, uh, very promising for this particular program. So the last program I'm going to talk about is uh, one of our more further advanced programs. This is a DNMT1 inhibitors. We have a couple of papers uh, uh, out on this. Um, DNMT1 is a, a methyl transferase. It's, um, it's involved in um, hypermethylating uh, various genes in the context of AML. What this does is it, uh, is it, it methylates uh, a number of different uh, genes that are required for differentiation and um, cell cycle regulation. So just briefly, um, we ran a couple of uh, studies looking at decidabine, which is the kind of the standard of care, and then uh, in 9639, and here it's NTX301, and looked at the fold change of a number of different genes uh, that uh, we then ranked and clustered and showed that, that these this re-expression of genes uh, in, in treatment all correlate to myeloid cell differentiation. And in the case of AML, um, you would see why that's something that we would we would want to look for as a, as a means for treatment. Um, we went and further proved this by uh, treating with, um, with uh, uh, 9639 and showed after 72 hours, you get a really nice uh, maturation shift and, and uh, differentiation of, of, um, of these cells into uh, uh, a more mature phenotype that is less likely to be proliferatively out of control. Uh, this, uh, this is in clinical trial right now, um, and it, it's uh, moving along as you would expect. Uh, we are seeing some uh, of the same things that we saw in, both in vitro and in vivo in the, in the patient samples that we've been analyzing. So uh, all that shows is that uh, our, our foundational work for this particular program has borne its way out all the way through into clinical trial. So... From there, um, how does this impact precision oncology? So um, I had uh, Dr. Khalila Brown, um, who is head of our uh, Catalyst program here, uh, think on and draw up a, a diagram of how uh, her program and our program interface. And much like uh, the, the uh, diagram that I showed you before, um, it's not all a hub. We, all of these things uh, cross pollinate and feed into each other to better help uh, inform both on our end what our targets should be and um, on the clinician side of things, what the, what the treatment should be to match with 
that particular profile. Um, this, this is going to end up having to be a, an omics based approach. It's going to end up having to be something that um, is going to require a lot of computational biology and chemistry and uh, something that will ultimately require a different way of thinking about how treatments should be scheduled, um, uh, prescribed, and how how they sh how patient progression should be monitored. So, key takeaways from this: um, what I would hope that you would get is uh, that the the immune contribution to the tumor microenvironment extends way beyond adaptive immunity. Um, and in fact, it, it probably goes back to uh, neutrophils, which I know my postdoc will be happy to hear. He'll get to work on something that he's he's worked on in a different context. But uh, it's particularly in breast, pancreatic, and colon cancer, there's uh, there's strong indication that um, that, that uh, bacterial infection, opportunistic bacterial infection, is a driver of some of the early stages of uh, the immune profile that leads to these kinds of chemo resistance in those patients. Um, the tumor cells themselves really influence whether or not the tumor immune microenvironment is going to be anti or pro tumorigenic. And how we treat those tumor cells um, can manipulate that balance a little bit. Uh, the way that we address novel drug discovery initiatives has to be more holistic. We can't, uh, targets have to be valid, they do, but the impact of targeting that target has to be understood in the context of not just a homeo uh, 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 homeogenic uh, population. Um, and all of these initiatives, as we are doing now, we're transitioning very heavily into computational chemistry, but computational biology, uh, bioinformatics, um, all of those things are going to play into how successful our drug discovery initiatives will be. Um, we are moving into spatial transcriptomics as a way to address this, uh, to understand how uh, single, single agents and combination therapies affect the transcriptional uh, landscape of a tumor, what that what that looks like in a hypoxic versus a normoxic environment, um, whether or not our drugs are getting penetrants all the way into the in, into the core of the tumors. Um, so back to a previous point, arriving at the right target for screening and medchem campaigns really does depend on an understanding of the role of that protein or target in the system. Um, there, there has to be a, a there has to be a strong foundation in, in, into understanding how what the impact of that of that therapy is going to be globally to make sure that the best targets are selected for the maximum impact. Um, and then something that we've done ourselves is we've taken a lot of our old uh, programs that that, that have um, stalled or halted or plateaued for whatever reason, and look back at the results, knowing what we know now, and um, seeing if we can apply what we saw biologically to what we, what we can do now um, in terms of manipulating the environment. Uh, and, and with that, we come up with novel combinations. And finally, it, I don't think for complex solid tumors that monotherapies uh, or even combination chemotherapies are going to be the way to go. Um, th these are going to require multiple um, multiple avenues of targeting to get the desired effect at the desired time for the maximum uh, impact on the patient. And uh, I don't have a thank you slide because I can't thank enough people. I think everybody at the Institute has probably touched one of these projects at, at any given time. Um, my team is uh, uh, tiny but mighty, and uh, um, and uh, we work in scientific platforms with a, a number of uh, wonderful people who have who have uh, helped with the medicinal chemistry and the screening and the 
in the molecular modeling. Um, so thank you to everybody that contributed to these, these works. You know who you are. Um, and then I'll take questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blocker, for your presentation. All right, a quick reminder, if you do have any questions, you can submit them in the Q&A box um, here in your Zoom toolbar. So we'll give just a second for those to come in. Okay, um, the first question is, is there a standard progression of immunological changes in the tumor microenvironment, and what is that natural time frame? Um, that's that's a good question. There is. It depends on what the uh, final pathology looks like. Uh, if you if you knew what the um, if you knew what the final outcome looked like in terms of um, like immune exclusion, you can say, okay, well, probably um, cancer associated fibroblasts were first thing to be uh, activated. Um, we can go back to this this image here. Uh, so oh, go ahead and share your screen again. So uh, you know, cancer-associated fibroblasts are going to make that fibrotic nest that's going to um, that's going to be a, a barrier, like the physical barrier that we talked about earlier. Uh, if you've got this mutant here, then then quite likely this is going to be the first thing that happens. Um, if it, it depends, ultimately it's going to depend on the the mutational state of the tumor itself as to what is going to be the trigger and therefore what the immune progression is going to be. Um, eventually though, most tumors will, will switch from this M1 to M2 macro, uh, 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 phenotype because that's the nature of the immune system is that you can't be turned on all the time. That's the purpose of, of the immune checkpoint inhibitors is to force that uh, immune checkpoint blockade to maintain the activity within the tumor. So uh, just like any other infection, treat it like an infection. It's going to um, follow that kind of progression where you would have a response. It's going to be blunted by something else that uh, that blunting is going to lead to in effect, uh, um, the ineffectiveness of, of treatment. And so then we have to kind of piece together what those steps were to, to generate a, a therapeutic profile. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, the second question here is a little speculative. Um, do you think that the PD-1 inhibitors developed in Southern research could expand the treatment for more tumor types than current drugs on the market? I guess yeah, so you, other disease states, essentially. Yeah, so so um, there, there are a couple of problems with large biologics um, that we set out to avoid uh, when designing the small molecule. Um, first off is it it's an infusion and um, it's easier to just take a pill. So if we could get something down to something that was orally bioavailable that still had the same effect as Keytruda, uh, you'd rather take a pill than go get, have to sit in a chair and get an IV infusion. Um, the second thing is, is that because these things are large, um, sometimes there is barrier to entry. Uh, there's uh, so and then there's barriers to clearance. So again, you don't want your immune system on all the time. Uh, an antibody is a large biologic. It's got inherently a longer half-life than a small molecule. So if you did have an adverse uh, immune reaction, it's harder to um, alleviate that without doing a lot of damage. Whereas if you had a small molecule that had a shorter half-life, well, okay, you change from taking the pill every day to every other day and still get the same therapeutic benefit. Gotcha. Here's a question. Do you think it is better to start with a known target or does that hinder the exploratory space? Um, I think that I'm going to speak on behalf of Paige Vincent, our director of HCS, and say a phenotypic screen is not the best place to start. It's better for us if we if if we know what we're looking for, because then we're um, in the, we're in a space of 
uh, understanding the biology a little bit better. It's better than a shot in the dark. Gotcha. Um, a question here. How does considering the immune microenvironment change the way therapies are scheduled? Yeah, that's so the way that we have addressed this in our uh, preclinical studies is that uh, take the thyroidine keytruda study. Um, we used, we had a good idea that the, that the um, thyroidine was going to be a primer and that even though keytruda on its own would have some anti-tumor effect um, just inherently because of the nature of, of that uh, immune inflamed characteristic of the MC38 tumor, we um, kind of proved the point and said, well, okay, if we make it more inflamed with these neoantigens, then we'll make a more durable response. So in that in that sense, we're kind of we're kind of testing that out as on a case by case basis, where we can say, look, we know how thyroidine is working, we know what it's doing. If we generate this immune response earlier on and then maintain it with a checkpoint inhibitor, that's a better outcome. So that's a way that, that we think about how to stage these, these therapies as we're matriculating them through the development process. Gotcha, thanks. It's sort of related to that. Um, how do you know what to combine in a combination therapy? And then how do you identify when one part of that combination therapy is no longer effective? Yeah, so um, we look at, uh, we've developed a number of um, co-culture systems that are rather complex, so we can, we can monitor early on in the, uh, in the discovery phase what, um, particularly what immune populations are being uh, um, senesced or uh, exhausted or expanded on. What, 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 what does the classical chemotherapy small molecule drug do in that um, uh, immune environment as artificial as it may be. And so then we can go back and look at what those regulatory mechanisms are on those immune cells and then pair the antidote to that uh, with the uh, classical chemotherapy. So thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions here, um, but we're getting through the list. So if you have a question, please go ahead and submit it in the Q&A box. Um, this first question is, how important are immune checkpoints in understanding time? Yeah, so I, if, if you remember when immune checkpoints first came kind of on the scene, it was the, it was the big ones, uh, PD-1, PD-L1, and CTLA-4. Um, as, as things have... Um, I guess, gone through clinical development and, and uh, efficacy, it seems like PD-1, PD-L1 is the, is the big gun there. It's the driver. Um, is it worth trying to target the other ones? Yes, but um, CTLA-4 exists on CD4 cells as well in high prevalence, and so you get some, you get some weird complications with, with targeting that. Um, and so it's a little bit cleaner to just focus on the CD8 uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, just because if you look at the differentiation tree of a CD4 versus a CD8, CD4 turns into a whole bunch of other things. You you end up with Tregs and CD7, uh, uh, TH17 cells and, and and all sorts of other things in between that can uh, that can be affected by your therapy and um, have. Uh, weird immune responses, whereas targeting the CD8 cells, that's terminal. It's terminally differentiated. It's not going to do anything else but be active or inactive. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, I guess, so another question here, how do you modulate immune response to mitigate risks of hyperactive, off-target, or non-specific response, particularly in reference to your point of memory and preventing recurrence? So, um, that gets into how and what the, um, the neoantigen is. Um, if, if we can very, in a very controlled way and understand what the mechanism of that immunogenic cell death is, um, and, and this gets a little bit into the more advanced therapies where, where you have, um, uh, 
LMPs that have mRNAs of known antigen sequences, then, then you can more carefully modulate how what that exposure is to that antigen. But um, uh, in terms of, uh, again, I'll go back to the thiobine uh, example, um, the mitotic catastrophe, we're not sure what in that, in that um, mix is is causing the um, inflammatory response. We think it's DNA damage, um, and we think it's TLRs, but it that's very broad in the grand scheme of things. <clears throat> and so, um, the the way I think that the way that the field will go is um, to to prime the tumor have the immune system respond how it's going to respond and then periodically pulse to make sure that it's still active as long as your tumor is um, is still present or there's residual left or you'll like get maintenance therapy with a PD-1 inhibitor that's that's um, not very long lived um, that just makes sure that you maintain a basal level of those memory cells. But uh, as long as the rest of your immune system is pretty intact and you take away that checkpoint pressure or the checkpoint inhibition, the a normal immune system should return back to central memory. And we've seen that, we've seen that in a number of studies that we've run internally where you do get central memory. And then if you re-implant or re-expose, that will become effector memory um, on the back end. Got you. Thank you. All right, um, that's it for questions, um, all the time that we have. If you do have any additional questions, uh, please go ahead and reach out via email, info at southernresearch.org, or visit southernresearch.org for more information. Once again, this webinar was recorded, and it will be available for on-demand viewing uh, shortly. So we'll send out an email once that's available, and you can re-watch the webinar or share it with colleagues that might have missed it today. Please stay tuned for more webinars to come and subscribe to our email list to stay up to date. Thank you again, uh, Rebecca, um, for your good talk today in the Q&A, and to everyone for attending today's webinar. Have a good day.